Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Playing Trains on Mobiles. That's an amazing package put together by Aaron, uh, who's our moderator tonight, and uh, for to show some of the most amazing uh, films uh, about planes, trains, and automobiles. And that's what this genre committee uh, meeting is going to be about tonight. This panel is going to be with some illustrious people talking about planes, trains, and automobiles. My name is Dwayne Johnson Cochran. I am the chair of the genre committee, and I am with um, Kelly Jo Brick, who is my co-chair. Kelly Jo, take it away. Hey, everybody. Thanks again so much for coming out tonight. And yes, a huge thank you to our panelists for taking time to join us and sharing their experiences with us. Um, also, would love to invite you to our next upcoming genre committee. At Genre, we celebrate like all across all genres. It's a great community of writers uh, and who are supportive and inspiring. Our next meeting is coming up on Tuesday, January 6th. I uh, hope you can join us. And without further ado, we'll pass it on to the moderator and the person who brought this event to life, Aaron. Thank you so much, Kelly, Joe, and Dwayne. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Wiener. I'm so fortunate to be hosting this panel full of talented WGA writers who all crafted screenplays featuring some amazing vehicles. We're so lucky tonight to be talking to Andrew Marlowe, Graham Manson, Doug Richardson, Chris Fedak, and Matt Reeves. When I first pitched the idea for Planes, Trains, and Automobiles to the WGA's Genre Committee, I never thought we'd be so lucky to have the writer of Air Force One, the showrunner of Snowpiercer, the writers of, uh, the writers of the classic Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson movie Money Train, the action-packed film Ambulance, and the latest Batman movie, The Batman. Welcome, everyone, and thank you all for being here with us tonight. Hi. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with Planes and the writer of Air Force One, Andrew Marlowe. Uh, hi, Andrew. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Uh, right. There were there were so many great moments in the film uh, Air Force One, and this per particular plane can do so many incredible things. I was wondering, when you first started toying around with the idea for the script, how much did you know about some of these features that are found on Air Force One? You know, there's some stuff that's kind of common knowledge, but uh, in in tackling the story, I wanted to do the research and find out what the plane could do. Because for me, you know, if you're calling something Air Force One, it's very much a character uh, in the story and its capabilities, its limitations. Um, those to me were important story beats. And for those of you who've seen the movie, what the plane can do and what can be done on the plane kind of defines the narrative. But for me, it was how do I isolate my character so that the, the character of the president had to do it himself where no help was going to be coming. And so part of that, it, it, there wasn't a lot of stuff um, in the press about it. I found a National Geographic um, a video. It was back in the video cassette era where they showed a map of the plane and I was at home with my VCR trying to pause to get on the map of the plane to understand exactly what the layout was. Because when I called the presidential flight office, they weren't necessarily cooperative in terms of giving away the secrets. Um, but you know, in tackling that, you know, understanding what it's capable of, understanding what its military defenses uh, were, uh, understanding you know the kinds of planes that flew with it for protection or or didn't, uh, you know, all of those were very important to be able to craft the story. Yeah, there's a there's a scene in particular I always I'll always remember where Harrison Ford playing the president. Uh, you know, indirectly tells an American pilot to like fire on the plane so that the the automatic defense system will evade the attack and knock a gunman who's like, you know, uh, covering him to off his feet. And so he'll be able to disarm him. Uh, do you remember writing that scene? And was that something that came from early discussions about some of the plane's capabilities? Um, very much so. Uh... And, you know, in that scene, it was trying to figure out a way that the president could communicate in code uh, and have uh, somebody fire on the plane in case somebody was listening in, uh, in order to give himself the advantage. But, you know, so many things came, came into the storytelling. There's a point where the president dumps fuel 
well, Air Force One can be refilled in flight. So, you know, it created a, a very exciting sequence of it being refilled and, and uh, you know, the C-130 that's refilling it, uh, uh, you know, it gets jammed up and explodes, you know. Um, so there, there's lots of fun to be had. And, you know, when I was thinking about this panel, the first thing is, you know, when you're dealing with planes, trains, and automobiles, it's always, how do you make it a character? And we all have the advantage of, you know, velocity uh, um, and what speed can give you dramatically and what isolation can give you dramatically is something that, uh, you know, I felt really excited to lean into. Um, and, you, you know, looking at everything as a character when the um, uh, F-15s that end up escorting Air Force One, when Air Force One's being fired upon, you have an F-15 coming up and actually taking the missile in the belly. To me, that was like the F-15 being the Secret Service agent jumping in front of the president, taking the bullet. So, um, you know, there, there are all those great little details. You know, there was a, a detail that made it into the script, but not into the, the, the final, uh, final film. Uh, one of the rooms in Air Force One can transform into an operating theater. Mm. Uh, so if there is any emergency, there's always a surgeon physician that flies with Air Force One. So I was having a fight in there and I scripted it where, you know, he uses the cardiac paddles to take down one of the terrorists and says, you know, the action line clear after that. Mm -hmm. That ultimately didn't make it in. Harrison thought that was a little too cute. But it's really, you know, it's, it's really great to dig in and, and see what you can take advantage of. Um, as a dramatist, because it's, you know, with, with some of these vehicles, it's, it's laid out for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that was actually my next question for you was that that was the other iconic scene that I remembered that I'll never forget was when the plane refuels in midair. I just always thought that was so cool when I first saw the movie. Um, are, were there any other of your uh, other features that you loved in the, in the, in the, um, the aircraft that you wanted to speak about? Because i that was my last question for you. Uh, well, you know, the one I could never get confirmation on was whether there was uh, an escape uh, pod on the plane. But when I was doing my research and calling around, as I do, I'm sure I'm on some FBI, CIA list somewhere, um, and was asking about it, the response I got from the presidential flight office was, well, it would make sense that we would be able to get the president off the plane if there was an in-flight emergency. So I just used that as dramatic license. And of course there was cinematic precedent with the escape pod in uh, Escape from New York where the president in that plane, you know, takes the escape pod and ends up in New York. So, um, but all sorts of great details, you know, the, the ramp at the back uh, for, with the parachutes, parachuting out of it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it was a really rich environment to be able to tackle. And when you have a small confined area, part of the challenge is how do you make it feel much more expansive than it is? Uh, so being able to use the upstairs and the downstairs, you know, the belly of the plane and being able to sneak through all of that, you know, really gave me an opportunity to be able to craft a great cat and mouse as well. Yeah, the, the the other image that just comes to mind when I first saw the movie was that I th I thought it was so cool that he was watching the football game in his private quarters, um, <laughs> you know, and I just thought that was that really just opened up the world for me when I first saw it. So uh, thank you so much for for that insight. That's great. Uh, I really wanted to um, make sure I had enough time to talk to everyone. I'd love to move on to uh, to trains next and talk a little bit with the showrunner of Snowpiercer, Graham Manson here. Uh, Graham, thanks so much for being with us. One of the most interesting concepts from the Snowpiercer franchise uh, to me was the arrangement of the train cars from front to back in order of societal class. Uh, it was something I certainly remember from the movie and it was something that I noticed that was uh, that crossed over into the pilot and into the series. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, to that idea and and whether you always knew that that was something that would become a part of the show. Um, yeah, that was really, you know, part of the um, part of the, 
the franchise, the graphic novels to begin with, and and um, you know director Bong's film that I really loved. So that class divide, you know, was was a huge uh, a huge part of like dramatizing what what the you know what it ultimately is 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 it always the real war is inside the uh, is actually inside the vehicle right uh, you know like in Snowpiercer the the train can't stop you know just so it's like speed and you know like in that way and you can't even go outside so you know you're limiting yourself and you're limiting yourself to the inside and to the to the real um, human drama. Uh, and then, you know, um, uh, you have all of the, um, you, you have all of the challenges of then having to put your action inside and designing the sets around that. Um, I'm sure everybody, there's, there's a few other train guys here, but a plane too. When you start, when you start trying to uh, coordinate action sequences inside the, in, inside the, uh, these small spaces, um, you know, uh, that's uh, that's a lot of fun too. You end up you end up being um, really in in close and dirty and a lot of rabbit punches rather than swinging for the fences. Yeah, I I, I hear you. I you know I was going to say during the the pilot, I really felt like some of the sets were uh, given the space were just so elaborate and incredibly uh, crafted. Uh, you know, so hats off to the production team for that um you know and and just thought the pilot looked fantastic um certainly the the piece that we showed in the in the clip reel as well um yeah, the, was, uh, the, it's the the sets the sets really you know really made the show and um uh you know the network always wanted one you know what's our wow set this year like so we got to have one one new one each each year to keep it interesting um, but I always like trying to sneak in little spaces on the train that you hadn't uh, seen before and try and, um, you know, find other little um, geographic discoveries within your, within, your within your vehicle. That's so cool. Yeah, I remember specifically the, the, the set that was like uh, underwater where she was scuba diving in the pilot it really stuck out to me. Yeah, the aquarium uh, car. We blew that up. <laughs> How was that? Was that was that an experience? It was a it was a CG experience to behold. Yes, I bet. I bet. <laughs> Nobody um, got wet. <laughs> <laughs> on a sitcom, we would do that. That would be like the last shot of the day. <laughs> um, it, it, it's in the in the pilot. There's a lot of talk about this idea of like one tail, um, and I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, about the origin of that phrase and and what it meant moving forward in the series and how it kind of played into this this kind of class struggle that was going on throughout the series. Yeah, well, it just sort of became a catchphrase, um, you know, a rallying cry. And then as the series sort of wore on, we got into we got into um, you know into second season. The classes up train as the tailies, you know, they fought for their rights and they fought for their recognition and Leighton won and, um, and you know, one train became a rallying cry for the whole train. So uh, that was interesting. I think it's also something that David Diggs got really sick of saying. And by, <laughs> by, by season three, we were toning down the one trains by request. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, I can see that for sure. Um, and and you know the idea of a of a train kind of circumnavigating uh, as it does. Um, it, it's it, I also always love that it was sort of very sort of cyclical the way that we would think about seasons and and moving through the year. Um, you know, I I I just loved the idea of talking about that in the in the show as well. Um, and so uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed the show. Um, and thanks so much for, for coming on the panel. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit with the, uh, the writer of Money Train, who we have here, Doug Richardson. Um, and we, it, what's interesting is we're now moving to this idea of, of, of being on trains that are underground as opposed to above ground. 
I thought that was really cool the way the panel worked out that we actually had people who were doing above ground trains and below. Um, you know, we have this this subway car that is, you know, moving the money around from the subway's earnings. Uh, and we have Wesley Snipes and Woody Harrelson who are playing brothers and cops who who are going to, you know, rob this train. Um, Doug, I'm wondering, how, do you, how did you first approach this idea of a train robbery story that exists on, on an underground train? Um, and was that something that came up very early or on in, in the thinking <clears throat> about this? That was the... Uh that was the genesis of it all. And what I thought was a terrible title, <laughs> you know, it's, it's that I, a friend of mine just volunteered to me that, did I know how, or asked me that I know how they picked up all the money from the kiosks inside the New York subway system. And I said, I have no idea. And he said, they have a train. <laughs> and I said, they have a money train. And that's it. That's how it all got started. Suddenly it's, it's as old as the hills and it's the great train robbery in the subway. I mean, and then it turned into white men can't ride the subway, but at least I got that joke out of the way. Um, I didn't know it was a cult classic, by the way. So thank you. Oh yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, and I, you know, I, I was, uh, reading about, you know, the, the history of the train system uh, in preparing for the panel and, uh, you know, the, the idea that we're so far away from from paying money on trains now that you know, everybody's using transit cards uh, certainly is the evolution of, of public transit uh, on trains these days. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, one other question I wanted to make sure I asked you was, without spoiling the ending of the film, did you know that when you initially were breaking the story, uh, that the subway being enclosed would actually help with the final sequence and the resolution of of the of the story. Uh, it went through a couple of uh, of incarnations. I was rewritten at one point, uh, so <clears throat> uh, and then there was a little bit of speed thrown in there uh, uh, on on top of it. But um, yeah, it's it's. It, you know, it was just the whole idea of the enclosed space. Uh, you know, it, it goes back, it's fun listening to all these other gents talking from the enclosed space of Air Force One to the Snowpiercer train and, and, and the worlds that you can create that you didn't know about that existed down there um, and how you could use that to forward the plot and, you know, pin in the characters in the, in the different and hard spaces. What was hard was I spent a lot of time in the subway system doing research with Tony Scott, which was a, a blast. And there was so much stuff um, down there that is not used, uh, that ended up not being in the movie that you couldn't put in. It was a whole world. And uh, it was just finding the right stuff. and. In the end, keeping it all enclosed, uh, I had a more tragic ending. So, because it was a little bit of a, 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 dar a darker picture once Woody and Wesley came aboard, they decided to service the white men can't jump kind of relationship. So, um, yeah, so I don't, I don't really recall if I, I recall how I ended it and it wasn't exactly uh, it was more like a bit of relief when the subway, when the train actually is released and goes above ground at some point and all the money is, is released into Jamaica Bay. So, you know, so that was, that was then, but anyway, I'm just having fun sitting here as flying the wall. I'm in a hard <laughs> time not jumping in and wanting to ask questions because these are all my favorite movies. <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely a lot of time for that. So we'll, I think we'll definitely uh, have, have time to do that. Um, thanks so much for sharing those stories. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I know our, our audience certainly does as well. Uh, I would love to take a chance to move on to automobiles. Um, we have Chris Fedak here who uh, wrote the movie Ambulance, uh, which recently came out with, with Jake Gyllenhaal. 
uh, where a, an ambulance becomes a getaway vehicle for two bank robbers who also have a paramedic and an injured cop inside. Uh, Chris, I'm, the first question I had, had for you uh, that I made sure I wanted to ask was, did you have to research what medical supplies were, were going to be in a, a basic ambulance um, and what devices were going to be able to be used uh, for, for when you kind of get into future plot points in the story? I usually start with bullshit. Like I make something up. Usually <laughs> I start with what I want to be in the ambulance. And then I once I've figured out my structure and my story, then I go back and I do the research to figure out how screwed I am. <laughs> so luckily enough, I was like, I, I, I didn't have, I didn't go too far afield of uh, what would actually be in the back of an ambulance. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's my usual, my usual research principle. I, I love that. That's uh that's fantastic to kind of go for what you want and then see if you can make it work. Uh, I think that's a really cool way to, to approach it. Um, you know, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, I'm sure it's many people's favorite scenes is when uh, the the um, uh, when the paramedic has to perform surgery on the cop in the back of the ambulance and she has to conference in via phone all these doctors who she knows to kind of look at look through video at the patient while they're having a high speed chase from the LAPD. Um, you know, did you have that idea as the writer early on to like to to have that be a big sequence in the film? Uh, was that something that came along during the development? I'm curious how that all came about uh, because it seems like such a really, such a cool space to to operate in, literally. Um, it was always there. It's always in the story. And um, uh, it was very, it was a very, um, uh, um, once Michael came aboard, you know, it was a very kind of like very interactive process, but the structure of the script always kind of remained the same. Like everything changed, but the bones of it were always kind of you know kept in place, and so the operation was always there, and and it was like that was the that was the what I wanted to do from the get go was to take a European movie, a, a Danish movie, Ambulansen, and kind of put it into very intimate movie, intimate thriller, and put it into a giant Los Angeles you know blockbuster action movie. But the action inside the ambulance had to stay intimate, so that like the craziest scream in the in the theater. Um, is when a gallbladder explodes, which is awesome, so awesome. And we had, uh, you know, I was about to say scientists working on, but I mean doctors, you know. And we had, you know, a team, and it's like, but that was like, we want to be in close. We want to have that intensity. We want everything to be like, you know, kind of like operating at eleven in that sequence. And um, uh, it was always there. And the funny thing was is that those were real doctors on the um, uh, on the monitor. So the the two guys on the golf course, like it was, it was the last thing I think shot for the movie. The movie mostly had been shot. Michael was back in Florida and he was trying to figure out where he was going to shoot inside a hospital for the doctors. And it was like, and then I pitched, was like, well, doctors are also on golf courses. So we rewrote it to the to a golf course. And then the it was annoying for the writer, but like the best improv line in the movie is the doctor, the surgeon who says, you and your criminal friend need to do this. And like, that's him. That's the actual surgeon you know, improv in the movie. So um, uh, yeah, everything just like, everything got better. That's fantastic. I, I, I imagine there's a lot of improvisation in, um, in residency. <laughs> so <laughs> that sounds, sounds like a fun experience. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Th there's another scene that, that really stood out to me in the movie uh, where the two bank robbers put in headphones and listen to the song Sailing by Christopher Cross. Uh, listening to soothing mu music on the highway during times of high stress in LA, I think is something that a lot of people here can relate to. Um, and I know that genre yacht rock has certainly become popular in recent times. Did you have a, a hand in choosing the song or did you always knew there was gonna, know there was going to be something that was of that, you know, uh, of that area that was going to be in the film? I love yacht rock. I've used <laughs> yacht rock. I, I, coming from television, you know, in TV, we picked the music. We're in charge of all this stuff, but like in in movies, it's like I I think Stanley must have, was Michael, and he wanted to say it wasn't in the original story in the script, so we added it in because we wanted a moment because we had so much crazy intensity. It's about two brothers, and they can fight, but in the next scene, they can be kind of like 
sharing some yacht rock as they're driving, you know, down the uh, 110 freeway. The other great thing about it too is like this movie was written, you know, all those times you sit in traffic and you're like, what the fuck is holding me up? I'm sorry for the F-bombs. What the what is holding me up here? I'm always like, it better be something good. It better be explosion. I better have blood. I, and so like, this was like, this was the movie that was like, the thing I was always envisioning was worth me sitting in traffic. <laughs> um yeah and, and and there's also this great part of the movie that i wanted to make sure i asked you about where the ambulance he plans to to kind of get the ambulance under an overpass uh so that his friend can have all these other ambulances waiting that are all going to drive out from different different sides to kind of throw the police cars and the helicopters off as to which which ambulance they're actually in um yeah, I remember in the movie, I think someone actually mentions that this is a military trick um, and something that they use in the military. I was wondering if that was something that you knew about before when you were conceiving of the idea um, or whether that was something that kind of came up as the script was being developed, because I thought it was such an interesting way to to kind of have a fun turn in the in the story. It pains me to say this, but this is the director's idea. So I originally had, so Michael, Michael, of course, like he knows he has incredible military advisors. He's done so many movies that have used like, you know, um, and so like this was an idea that he had taken from, I believe, what would happen in Afghanistan or in Baghdad when people were trying to lose essentially what, you know, you know, insurgents would do when they were trying to get away from, you know, Americans or drones or whatever, the, whatever in, in foreign lands. And so it made sense that these two guys would be able to use that same technique. What I had in the original script, and I don't like to talk about what was, it was in the original script, but it was a vehicle. Because like what I thought would be cool was that the bad guys would use a Monstura, which is a giant, you know, Mexican tank that drug cartel guys go around in, kind of like a Batmobile. And at that was so I had this crazy my own crazy sequence that I think that I'm uh, you know Michael looked at and he said I am a, I've seen too many monstero action sequences I was like what are we talking about <laughs> and he had a, he had a fantastic idea so that's what we went with cool cool uh, it's interesting that you that you said Batman because we were lucky also to have uh, Matt Matt Reeves who wrote uh, the new Batman movie The Batman. And uh, I'm so excited to talk to you, Matt. And, and I wanted to talk to you specifically about how we've seen so many unique and different Batmobiles throughout the franchise's history. Uh, but this one really felt so unique and new, uh, you know, much more from this sort of muscle car uh, family that, that we've seen, uh, you know, just emerge, uh, you know, throughout, throughout American history. But, you know, in the film, really, I think, gave it such a, a cool look. Um, and I, it was also something we featured in the, in the clip package. Uh, I was curious, what went into that choice? Was it something that came from Bruce Wayne's character in the story? And, and, and you know, which sort of came first? Was it a chicken or an egg? Or how did all the, the planning of, of which, what kind of vehicle and what it looked like come to be? Well, I mean, when you're doing, there've been so many Batman movies. And I think, you know, I was sort of looking at, the, I, for me, it was important to make it distinctive and be connected to who he was. And this version of him in the early days was, um, you know, he still was figuring out what it meant to be Batman. And the idea was sort of the idea that he could make everything himself. So like, if he was a gearhead, if he was like a car, like he could maybe like take a kick, take kick cars and kind of bash them together. And, and so very early on, I started thinking, you know, obviously my first, Batman sort of experience was with Batman 66, which is the year I was born. And I loved that Futura car. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then Burton did like a Gothic rocket, which was super stylized. And there've been so many different kinds. And then, you know, Nolan's Batman literally decided to make it a tank, which made total sense. But I was like, okay, so if this guy's on his own and he's building this thing, like he's a gearhead in his garage, then it should be like an American muscle car. And so very, very early on, that was kind of the conception. And there was also, you know, it's funny because I, I was trying to figure out a way to ground the story because the idea was to make it very grounded. I, I actually knew I wanted it to be Rob and what it was writing it for Rob. And, you know, I was thinking about it was the weirdest things are hard when you're trying to figure out how to do them for the first time. Like I was like, oh, well, going around in a bat suit really doesn't make any sense. Like if you're looking for crime, you're going to stand out. People go like, that's that guy in the bat suit. He's looking for crime. So we should hide. And I was like, well, 
that doesn't really make sense unless the idea is that he's kind of going around. That's where the alter ego came came about with the idea of him being kind of a drifter and riding like a cafe racer and sort of kind of disappearing almost like a Vietnam vet, which was from the comics. Like in, in Frank um, Miller's year one, there's a version where he literally looks like Travis Bickle and he just looks like a guy, he's Bruce Wayne before he's Batman. And so I wanted to carry through that mode into the vehicles as well. And I thought, okay, so driving around a Batmobile makes no sense. Like the only reason that you would do it is if you want to make the same impression that you made as Batman coming out of the shadows, which meant that you were trying to scare the hell out of people. And so it had to be a kind of theatrical experience. And then I wanted it to be kind of a, a car that would perform and that he could build. So that was kind of where it came from. And it's interesting process for me because since I did the first Planet of the Apes movies, Planet of the Apes movie that I did, which was Dawn, um, there was a, because Rupert Wyatt was originally supposed to do that movie, um, he had already hired a production designer who literally I've worked with on every single project I've done since then. His name is James Chinland. And so as I was writing, I would sort of describe this kind of muscle car. And then he would start sort of trying to sketch stuff. And we would have this kind of back and forth where I'd start describing kind of what I want the vibe is and what the purpose is. And he started saying, he goes, yeah, it's like a it's like a battering ram. We need like a battering ram. I was like, okay, a battering ram. And so we started working with car designers. And so it was a really neat process to be writing and also literally having conceptual designs going back and forth. So that was a pretty special part of it too. Wow. So the, the, while you were writing, you were getting conceptual drawings yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's and really I, knew I wanted it to have a bit of, because that first, the Batman 66 Futura car with those kind of bat wings, the fin tails or whatever, I wanted this to have, there were a few things I wanted. I was like, okay, so I want this to feel like a muscle car, but I want it to have that kind of fire turbine from the back. And then I want us to find our version of kind of like, you know, the bat wings and all of that. So, I mean, it's sort of a crazy moment because you're, you take on something like that and you go, oh my God, there've been so many good Batman movies, so many great Batmobiles. And you're going like, I, I, this is terrifying. And then another part of you goes like, wait, we're getting to make our own Batmobile. Like that was really, really cool. Did you get to spend a lot of time in the car when when it arrived on set, or you know, any... I did. I, I, I the thing when when it finally arrived because we built we built a couple of different versions. We built a version that was a gas version, and we built the electric version. And the electric version was actually faster. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we there was the day where it was finally done, and we brought it onto the back lot. And I called my wife and son, and my son was nine at the time, and he was the one who got to sit in, in it first. Um, which was really, really cool. I have like a, a my phone video of my son in the car. But I, you know, I sat in the car right then and that was it. That was that was like, you know, what was I gonna do? Drive it? But it was really, it was so cool. It was one of those moments you're going, like, hey, so this is our Batmobile. It was really cool. I can't imagine there's ever been a conversation about an electric uh Batmobile, like where, you know, it gets like the, the best fuel efficient. This is the Batmobile that that gets well, like, you know, yeah, and it's a plug, miles. you just plug it in and it's 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 wonder it's good for the environment, which is what's important. <laughs> um yeah, and and you know, I think you spoke a little bit to this earlier, but one of the other things I wanted to ask you was the personality of the car itself yeah. is featured in the clip package and I think in some of the action scenes where there's actually a lot of ramming that's going on between the yeah. car and and uh, and then some like really sort of gritty bulletproof glass action with with uh, guns. I was wondering if that was something that that came off of the personality of the car and the the, the sort of uh, you know conception of the car and what it was, and whether that informed how you wrote to those scenes. Yeah, I mean that was really the idea was in the same way that the bat suit was meant to be his armor, but was also it was it was sort of dual purpose where the idea is that. The bat suit and the Batmobile needed to have multiple purposes. One was just the theatricality of the appearance, the idea of trying to terrify. The, I wanted the movie to almost be like, actually, the, to be honest with you, one of the big references for me when we were writing was Christine. I wanted it to be like a horror vehicle. And so the idea of making it a beast that comes out of the shadow, that was one of the things that I talked a lot about with James. And even then later, you know, when we were getting deeper into it, because my sound designers, they come on super early too. And so they would send me sounds and stuff. And there was one movie I did with them where when I was writing, they were sending me like the sound of winds and that kind of stuff. And so trying to get the way that car sounded so that you could hear it kind of screaming sort of in the shadows and sort of being a beast. Like that was one part of it. And then the other part, it was just 
for it to be like a car out of a fast movie. You know what I mean? Like the idea of just being this car that would super perform and would be able to sort of really, you know, obviously the greatest chase scene ever is is the French connection. So thinking of it in that way where the car was kind of an extension of Batman's, of Rob's obsession and this idea of just like being willing to go through anything in order to get at who you were chasing. So it, it I wanted that kind of mixture of the theatricality, but also something that kind of felt almost more like a, or like bullet or something that set, felt kind of more like it was like retro back into the sort of sense of just a practical, I wanted to do everything as practically as possible. And as I literally wrote that in the script, I said an entirely practical Batmobile chase, which of course we didn't entirely do, but was very close. We did, there's a lot of stuff that, a lot of stuff we shot then had to be redone through VFX. So I wouldn't take anything away from what they did. They did amazing things, but we actually did jump that Batmobile through fire. Like that was one of the, I was like, can we do that? And I was like, that's probably has to be CG, right? And then Dom Tui, who is a physical effects guy, he was like, Oh no, I'll jump that through fire for you. I was like, okay, let's do that. That must have been, I mean, as a writer, that must have been just a, such a fun. Yeah, you're going like, oh my God. Because that was the whole idea. It was like to make it look like this hellish vision. And then to see all of these people, when you put together a team and they realize that thing and you go, oh, wow, that is really, that's cooler than even what I was seeing in my head, you know, when we're talking about it. So. Yeah, I think those are the most fun experiences that we have as writers when things come together that way. Uh, such a special story. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that somebody mentioned earlier that they maybe had questions for some of the other writers on the panel. Uh, I think this is a perfect time if, if anybody wants to ask someone else something. Uh, I think that would be really fantastic. Does anybody have anything for anyone else? I have a few questions that I can throw up for everyone, but if we want to do that first, uh, I'm into that. Are we good? Yeah, let, so let's, let's move. Oh, Doug, do you have something? Oh, I, I have a million things. If it, you know, it's, this is a, this is a terrible webinar you guys are putting on this. It's like, <clears throat> I want an entire webinar on Air Force One, on Ambulance, <laughs> on Snowpiercer, on it's, you know, I, I, it's, it's just, it's all kind of crazy. And I, I probably have too many questions going through my head and you should probably have people who are doing, watching this webinar, uh, ask the actual questions. Cool. Um, I, I have, a, I have a few for everyone. If anyone wants to, to take one, uh, the first question is, did, did any of you, and I think some of you maybe already mentioned that you did, but, uh, did any of you work with consultants during the writing of your, your film or your show? Um, and were there any specific consultants that you loved working with and reasons why uh, to help help explain the capabilities and, and um, abilities of, of, of the vehicles you were featuring? I, I guess I can answer that in the since I, everyone was pretty silent there. <laughs> it can also be uh, almost like what Chris said as far as the bullshit element of, of, of making it up. You know, you can also deal with the lack of consultants and on, on, on money train the transit authority didn't want to help us in any way at all uh they were there's actually an actual line in the movie uh that that robert blake actually says <clears throat> that came right out of the mouth of the guy who ran the transit authority <clears throat> that character is that guy um just this big bureaucratic asshole and it's like who are you why do you want to come make a movie about our train, my train? You know, we're not going to let you see it. We're not going to let you go in it. We're not going to let you, you know, we're not going to help you at all. <laughs> and it, we all, we, I thought we were dead at that moment. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, lucky it turned out that there were train tracks in downtown LA where they could build the world's largest set, you know, because New York was no help whatsoever. So we kind of, had to make almost everything up, you know, and there was no one there to say that's bullshit. That's not bullshit. Other than the money train <clears throat> in real life, I did see it and it looked like a dirty train car. It was disguised and everyone who worked on it looked like dirty train employees because they didn't want it. It looked like a yellow work train. That's kind of, <clears throat> that's how it was disguised. And 
obviously the studio didn't like a yellow work train. They wanted a silver bullet, you know, or as John Peters said, a giant penis going through tunnels. Yeah, I noticed that. The, I noticed that the train in the in the film does not look the way that it was the, the money train was described online. So that that sounds accurate, like what you're saying that you know you ended up building something different. Uh, was that something that was happening while you were writing, or was that something where they said we've got the train for you? Here's what it's going to look like. At the, at that point, I wasn't involved. You know, it was <laughs> it was Joe Rubin and John Peters and 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 all that. So, I mean, I did get to, you know, I was very impressed with the set that they built. I didn't think they could possibly build anything that could look like the New York subway. And they built it all above ground, north of downtown LA on those tracks. And they put, <clears throat> uh, they, they built regular train cars to look like subway cars and put big giant diesel engines in them. And, ran it down this mile long track as fast as it could go. And uh, they had all these local platforms and stuff. But when you walked, when you stepped off the, like most great sets, you know, you stepped in there, you were in the subway. It was quite remarkable. So they did that well. That's fantastic. Um, I, I have one more question for everyone else. Uh, if anyone wants to try to answer, what, uh, what's another vehicle that you would love to, if you had a chance to, uh, to tackle next, if you, if you had your pick, um, you know, whether you're from going from planes to trains or trains to cars, or even, uh, like, a like a spaceship I know is, is like, uh, uh, does anybody have like a wish list for what they'd like to maybe write next if they had the chance? There's no boats here. <laughs> How about boats? <laughs> Yeah, That's I mean, <laughs> there's been there's been a lot of great boat movies. I you know I actually realized when I when I titled the event, I kind of like worked myself into a corner with the boat thing. <laughs> but uh, it was definitely something we thought of. Uh, you know, maybe we can have a future panel where we where we talk about those. I love trains for whatever it's worth. I think the guys who have gone to work on trains, I think that's really. I love the I love the tradition, the cinematic tradition of trains from. Konkolovsky's runaway train to, you know, the general to, to, you know, Frankenheimer's the train, which is like the most amazing movie. You know, there's something so visceral and you're just, you know, it, it, there's a great energy to it. So if I could ever crack a train movie, I would love to figure that out. You also do mysteries on trains. Everything was better on trains, just for what it's worth. Three or four years on trains, really. <laughs> the tra train starts too long. to wear a little thin. Too long. <laughs> yeah. Too long. Not for a TV show, no. Yeah. Is you it know, I, I, I'd love to tackle something in space. You know, I was, I was pretty wowed by what gravity did technically, but also just in terms of the storytelling, how um, they kept the pace up in that uh, in, in an extraordinary way. Um, so I think that would be really fun to tackle. With trains, it's it's all about, can you find that interesting idea that presents as something new? Because I don't wanna be in a situation where I'm writing and the two characters get on top of the train and they fight just because I've seen it so much. So, you know, what what Doug did with the money train, it's like, okay, that's that's awesome. Or, you know, what's going on with Snowpiercer, it's presenting the environment in a brand new way. And to find that brand new way would be really, really exciting. I, I actually had a question for, for Doug when you were doing Money Train. Did you go back and watch Pelham 123? Did you have any of the train touchstones that you would revisit when you were oh, doing? Oh yeah. Um, uh, Tony, that was the main, uh, and the film was a little, that I wrote was a little, closer to Pelham 123. Um, but yeah, it sounded like I, it the way you were describing it, that that darkness. It had sort of like, it had, there was a tragicness to, the, to, to, to the, the friendship, but Tony, I was a huge fan of the movie. And instantly when Tony and I sat down for the first time, we began talking about that. And that was our reference the entire time. And then all the time we spent in the subway system, you know, with the, with the tr transit cops, who were helpful, by the way. Um, uh, 
it was it was just one reference after the next to not only all the train movies and scenes that we'd seen, but always back to taking a Pelham one, two, three. So it wasn't a shock when Tony finally did the remake, you know, and Unstoppable. I mean, he's yeah. He had, he had more train in him than me, but he loved it. We were like two kids down there, just, you know, trains and driving and tunnels and, and uh, yeah, and all, and all the potential visual possibilities. I had one more question for everyone. Uh, were there, were there any uh, movies or TV shows that you had watched that, that really sort of played into your inspiration for writing these pieces that you, that you worked on? Um, you know, were there, were there, were there, uh, you know, iconic action franchises that, that maybe uh, got you interested in this genre to begin with? Just to say it again, the original Taking Up Pelham 123, I remember watching that in film school and just like being, I, actually watching it in TNT in my dorm room, you know, like on, on regular TV and then running, running downstairs to the cafeteria to the other film nerds and going like, you got to stop what you're doing. And we got to get a Betamax out of USC film school and watch, you know, Taking Up Pelham 123. It's so freaking good. And it's like, it, you know, it's not, it's a hostage movie, but it also... It also does that super cool thing is it jumps all over the city to the coolest person so you can do two scenes with the mayor that's all you need you can do like you can get every great character actor in the city do two or three scenes with them and just go from the most exciting story to the most exciting story and pelham does that Die Hard does that we attempted that in ambulance of just like jumping around to like where we want to go we can find the most interesting thing and have that person in that moment so i think it, it, Pelham is super, super important. It's deceptively important in the tradition of action movies. For me, it was um, definitely French Connection, like I said, and Bullet. But I have to say something that wasn't related at all, except it's related to, and, and Christine, but the one that I always think of that it's not, the whole movie's not a vehicle movie, but William Friedkin's redo of uh, Wages of Fear, uh, Sorcerer, I think is an incredible movie. And they do... When they put those trucks together that are going to transport that nitroglycerin, and there's this amazing scene back before there was any CG or anything where that truck is going across a rope bridge, like rung by rung. It's this crazy moment. And there's a moment where he's just, there's a guy on his knees just waving him, like bringing him forward, like, and you're going, and the whole thing is swaying. And it's just the craziest thing you've ever seen. And you're just like, oh my God, this is, it's such a force of nature. And when they bring that car, to life, it's like a beast. And so it is, there's something in that movie to me that is also like a great kind of really, really cool vehicle movie. So great. And not and not many people have seen that film. Oh, it's so good. You know, and that's a sequence that, you know, just really stands out as one of the, oh, well, that's the standout scene in the whole, totally. in the whole yeah. film, but it's, it's a really underrated and unseen movie that most people should go look at, like taking a Pelham one, two, three, you know, there's, there's a great 4K Blu-ray out that we screened at a friend's house not too long ago of Pelham, of, of Pelham 123. And, oh, just holds up. I wonder if we can, uh, maybe when we put the, uh, the write-up of the event out, we can, we can share our, our panelists' suggestions for movies to watch. I'm sure uh, the people watching would love to see that. Um, we do have a few fun uh, questions from people who are watching, uh, one of which I, I thought was really interesting. I, they, they would love to hear what everyone's first cars were. Does anyone want to share, uh, you know, what you what you first drove when you were when you got your first? I had a Toyota Corolla. <laughs> My mother's Volkswagen Jetta. Super cool. It is 66 Chevy half ton pickup. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I so wish I a, still had it. A, 60, a 67 uh, Carmen Ghia. Nice. Very nice. So uh, m my first car that uh, I, I could sort of call mine was my parents' Volvo station wagon. Mm. But the first one I bought for myself was a Mustang convertible. Mm. Redemption. 
Um, here's another great question from the audience. Uh, whenever you ride a plane or train uh, or automobile in regular life, uh, do you ever find yourself imagining story and action sequences set set in the vehicle that you're riding? Um, and and if so, does it does it ever freak out your non-riding companions? Of course, of of course, you imagine it. That's what we do all day. You know, I, I, I think we are professional, what could go wrong people. And then we make a list of what could go wrong and <laughs> like, what are we gonna do about it? You know, I, I can't drive through a tunnel into New York city without thinking that the tunnel is gonna collapse. I or, have the same thing. It, yeah, it, 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 it crosses your mind. But the funny thing is doing Air Force One and, and talking to, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the folks who are specialists, it's really hard to, to have a plane crash, you know, the, the way they're designed when they're well designed. So it actually give, gave me a level of comfort when I was flying, you know, and with turbulence and stress and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, but of course you think of the worst case scenario. You know, sometimes I'm driving around LA and I'm like, why do I trust the thousand people I'm passing to stay on their side of the road? It's just, you know, it's dramatist habit. That's what we do. I had a writer once ask me after uh, on Die Hard 2, if, if I uh, had any karmic issues and concerns considering, you know, there was a, at that point, it was the biggest, most dead bodies, I think, in a single scene in a, in a film where the, the aircraft is, is forcibly crashed um, you know, and did, was I incurring any really bad karma from that? And I, I don't necessarily believe in karma, so I wasn't at all worried, but I mean, it, there's not a time I don't get on an, an aircraft that I, A, don't think of that comment, <laughs> and B, try and remember the three days I spent in the JFK Tower with these people that made me feel air travel is the safest thing you could possibly do. You know, so it's sort of like being pulled in both directions and re reminding yourself that, oh, this is a really, this is a really well-made aircraft. And my son now is a Boeing engineer and he continues to confirm that, how safe these aircraft are. You don't always have to have to think of the uh, disasters that can befall you as well, although although for sure. But you know, the uh, um, you know riding trains while I was working on Snowpiercer, I would pay close attention to the staff and what they had to go through every day, and just you know normal conversations and things you can you can fill in uh, fill in the blanks with and uh, and create a world um uh before the big things befall you <laughs> i've actually found great eavesdropping on trains both on the subway and also on the commuter trains on the northeast corridor because everybody thinks that they're speaking privately even though everybody can hear them it's a really interesting phenomenon nobody speaks privately anymore though <laughs> <laughs> There's so many just like little passion plays going on. Um, I, yeah, it, I, I've noticed that as well. Uh, one of the one of the other movies that we featured in the in the package was Bullet Train, which I saw at the Guild Theater recently, and and uh, there was there was actually there were a couple of scenes where they people were trying to speak private, privately on a train, but you know other people were maybe overhearing. Um, so that, I think that's also a really interesting, uh, element that can come into play in a, in a train, which is more of like a public, uh, you know, a public setting, uh, for these types of, of movies. Um, we had, we had another really interesting question that just popped up. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on toggling between CGI and practical vehicles, uh, in your, in your films or TV shows? I'm not, not sure if everyone dealt with this particularly on their film or films, but uh, or or shows, but uh, I, I'm sure maybe I'm guessing maybe Snowpiercer had some of that stuff. Um, very little exterior stuff. Um, we would do just little pieces of practical windows in the exterior, and everything was CG. Um, but uh, um, 
you know, so I'm sure Matt has a lot more experience like of melding those, melding like the real car chase. We were we were such a stage show. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think what I always try to do, I think for me, the basis for all good VFX is shooting as much in the shot that's real. And it's interesting how once you have um, once you have enough good reference of the car for real, like there are some shots where we're replacing the Batmobile, but they none of them wouldn't none of them would have worked if we hadn't shot the Batmobile and built the Batmobile and had it do all of the things that we had it do. And so you really, you don't ever want people to think that you're, that you've got a CG shot in there. I mean, we have some shots that there was one that we had in, um, in uh, when he's racing back because uh, Alfred is in danger and he realizes before Alfred knows that he's in danger. And we didn't have the Batmobile in the US, but we had all this reference that we had shot in the UK. So we actually had a proxy vehicle. And so the car that's in there is not the Batmobile. It's like a, it was a, um, it was a BMW, but we just replaced it. So once you have enough reference, you actually can do that. But obviously the key is to, uh, is to shoot as much real as you can. Isn't that amazing that in 2022, it's like back in the day, CG was special. Like yeah. there was a point in the nineties where you're like, whoa, CG. <laughs> and now it's like the amazing thing about the Batman is just like how much of it doesn't look you know, like CG. It looks like this amazing, it's like someone took a, it made a 1970s thriller and with, with all the te technology of today. And it's so, it's so incredible. It's like with it, with ambulance, Michael was like, we, we, he had 40 days to shoot it. And so it's, there's very little CG in it. You know, there's, there's erasing drones from it. But for the most part, like very little amount, it's like I watched the director's cut and you, you've never seen a director's cut like this. You've never like, you know, it's like, holy shit. Like you thought we blew up half of Los Angeles. And, it, <laughs> and so much of it was practical because we were working within a, time, a type timeline. And um, and he didn't he, he he wanted to own the same thing. He wanted it to feel visceral and real. You know, with Air Force One, it was uh, a mixture of model work. And then at the end, it was uh, CGI. And, you know, this was, God help me, 25 years ago. Um, and CGI wasn't as fully developed. And there's a shot that still pains me at the end where the plane goes down and it hits the water because they hadn't quite cracked water yet. And the plane was too clean. It, it, it didn't feel like it was fully dimensionalized. The light wasn't hitting it correctly. But there's a certain point where you run out of time and money. You know, that's 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 a short sort of shot. You know, today that people wouldn't have to think too much about. But if you think about it, you know, Air Force One came out just before Titanic, and even in Titanic, you know, they had they had some really great water work. But when they you know come around the ship a couple times, it it looks like a, a CG model, and it can take you out of of the the visceral experience. I even find that with um, you know some of the new Star Wars that all the ships are uh, mostly CGI, and I find myself missing that you know the practical model element, and that if there's a combination like what Matt was talking about, then I think the audience gets more of that visceral sense, and it fools the eye a little bit more. But I did want to ask you, Matt, you know, you, you, you know, in, in, in television, you can never really do real fire you create as much reference as you can on set and then you do all the augment uh, all the augmentation digitally and you hope that you've done enough for the audience to grab onto so it doesn't look like a digital file fire but when the the batmobile was going through that fire how much of that was uh, practical you know uh i would say 90% of it was practical like we had it did go through a wall of flame and then what we did was we created extensions sort of beyond and around it but it was shocking. That was one of those things where when we were shooting it and I was looking at it, one of the things I wanted was to shoot a shot that was in the rear view mirror and we set up a camera on it. So we actually, I thought that's the kind of thing where you could really mess it up and people's like, oh my God, you should be shooting. Why are you shooting through the mirror when you should just be shooting the thing? But when that shot was happening and I was watching it through the monitor, I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it was all practical. Like they were just, the, the, the team was really, really great. And you're right. One of the hardest things to do is fire. And doing it in CG, it just often never quite looks real. And we had so much that was real that then when they added what they added, it was a lot easier.
to add it because they had so much strong reference. So again, that's one of those things. Fire, the elements are super hard to do. Water is super hard to do. They've gotten much, much better at all those simulations, but it's but fire is one of those things that when you know when it, when it feels real and you look at it, it probably is real or at least had enough reference that made you um, made them have have the artist something to really go from. Uh, I, we have, I think we have one more question um, and then maybe we'll wrap up, but, and we maybe have covered this a little bit, but I just want to make sure we give everyone a chance if, if they haven't shared. Uh, what have been your favorite uh, vehicular, vehicular sequences from movies uh, over the years, uh, whether recent or, or in the past, um, that you remember from your time watching films and TV shows and why do you think they work so well? God, how many? <laughs> There's so many. So many inspirational. I, I, I love mean, going from... back to like Rockford Files, you know, like <laughs> just the classic moves of just slamming it in reverse and fishtailing out of there. And, you know, that, that it starts there. And then, and then you try and chase from foul play. Do you remember the ending of foul play? Yeah. When they're in the car, he just commandeers that car and they're just driving. It's like, like anyway sorry <laughs> there's a picture that we watched recently uh as part of this pelham one two three thing uh with a, a couple of film geek friends of mine uh and it was a, a movie that was not in that i'm just going to recommend people see that i saw in the theater called the seven ups uh great movie yeah. shot in metro color way back when and I'd forgotten it. That entire movie was built around. We hired the stunt guy from Bullet, and we said we want you to do Bullet in New York City. <clears throat> and they did Bullet, and mostly in the boroughs. But the whole point was to out Bullet Bullet, and it really does. <laughs> I mean, the rest of the movie, you know, doesn't necessarily hold up. But if you can go find that on DVD or stream it or something it is one of the all-time balls out i mean you could actually you could in some shots you gotta go oh no they, that that camera's gone they that they that camera's gone that <laughs> uh he missed that turn that almost killed those people i mean it was done a lot of stuff without permits but it's it's quite special to watch um, my two favorites are uh, going back to my train fetish, which I feel like I'm just revealing tonight, is the lady vanish vanishes as Hitchcock, which is just like the whole thing is just so wonderful, just delightful and wonderful. And um, uh, if you're obsessed with it, it's 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 a great kind of introduction to English Hitchcock. And the writers are Gillette, and uh, they're wonderful too, and they did all these great English movies. Um, and then, but the, there is a one more um, train movie um, called The Train. Frankenheimer's The Train. And it's a you know black and white from the 1960s, set during World War II, and it's about a you know Paul Schofield plays this Nazi trying to get all the art out of the Louvre into you know out of out of Paris, and Burt Lancaster's the the engineer who's going to stop him. And there's like so much amazing action; it's so real. All the trains are real. You have like Burt Lancaster just flying around this Paris train yard, going from you know it's amazing, and it's all it all has that texture, that realness that you know, Matt and the guys are talking about. You know, actually, when you mentioned Hitchcock, that makes me think also of, I love foreign correspondent and there's an amazing plane crash in that, which they did, which they did, it's an effect. And they literally did this thing where they were projecting and then they had water go through the screens. And you cannot believe that they actually did this in that day and that they pulled it off. It still holds up today. And, you know, for, for me, I, you know, Bullet's great, French Connection's great. Looking at what Spielberg was able to do in Sugarland Express with oh, no time great, and yeah. no money, just the shot choices in that are really interesting, really that's phenomenal. That's one of my favorite movies of his still. It's a great movie, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, so it great. really is. It's so great. It's so great. From the sniper, I mean, just again, going to, the, you know, jumping around to all the most exciting parts, it's so great. And the Velma Zygman photography. Oh, oh, so great. Great choice. And then, you know, a, a, like the modern stuff, Baby Driver was phenomenal. Oh, yeah. That, that opening sequence. 
Um, but it's really interesting to go back to look at, you know, what, uh, what Matt was saying about Sorcerer, how people develop tension with, you know, a really simple idea, really well executed, that you don't have to pull out all the tricks. If you've done the work with the character and you're invested in the moment, you're invested in the scene. Um, and that's why I really like what Spielberg did with Sugarland. Cool. Uh, this, this, I, I can't thank you all enough. Uh, this was so wonderful. Uh, Andrew Marlowe, Graham Manson, Doug Richardson, Chris Fedek, and Matt Reeves, thank you for sharing your time and your stories and your experiences on set um, and, and in writing these, these amazing uh, movies and TV shows. Uh, and thanks from the genre committee and everybody watching tonight. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get that list of recommendations out to everybody who was watching and uh, everybody, everybody be well and stay dry. I know it's been rainy today and, uh, and, and th just thanks again so much. This was such a lovely, uh, lovely panel. Really great to meet you guys. Nice to meet that you. That was fun guys. Thanks a lot. It was All fun right. being here.